So, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me. Can somebody confirm? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, today, I will tell you something about scheduling uh, that uh, belongs also to the AI technique, although it is not, uh, uh, let's say, um, the kind of uh, neural network based, uh, let's say, solutions. As usual, I will introduce you to uh, methodology. Then I will uh, tackle the scheduling problems from a uh, different aspect point of view. I will also introduce you to uh, general methods, how scheduling can be solved, mainly using uh, my mouse, uh, using taboo search. Uh, I will introduce you to one technique uh, from flow shop scheduling, and then I will focus uh, lastly on critical path method that uh, you can use, and I will think that uh, I can, uh, I think that uh, you will use it uh, in your practice a lot of times. So uh, to the methodology, uh, I spoke about classical planning to uh, lectures before. And in that case, we had an issue what to do in what order. And uh, in some cases, it can be extended. Uh, so for example, uh, we can consider how long an action can take, when it occurs, and so on. Scheduling is, uh, uh, deals mainly with temporal constraints and resource constraints. And basically, it is about this kind of issues. So it, it is like planning. But main focus is uh, given to these constraints. An example can be, for example, airline scheduling. You need to know which aircraft is assigned to which flights. Uh, you need to know departure and arrival times. You need to assign employees, the crew. And it is uh, you have only limited resources of the employees. And if an aircraft crew is serving on a flight uh, on one flight, of course it cannot be uh, presented uh, present also in another flight. Uh, you will see that there are many scheduling problems, and that's the reason why so-called Graham's classification was introduced to make some kind of, uh, let's say, overview and uh, kind of methodology uh, how to solve it. Uh, general solving methods uh, can be also divided to a number of techniques. Um, the exact solving methods are usually based on branch and bound methods. In many cases, however, uh, the um, the solutions uses, use uh, some kind of heuristics, like dispatching rules. So for example, if you need to do something, uh, you have a rule what to do, in what order, with how many resources, and so on. You can search using so-called beam search. That's, that means it is a kind of focused search to the specific uh, segment of the space. A number of local search techniques like simulated annealing, taboo search, genetic algorithm can be utilized. And today I will present you one method that deals specifically with a taboo search. Of course, these uh, tasks uh, might be also defined using pure mathematical tools, uh, for example, like linear programming or integer programming. And uh, in the last lecture, we uh, dealt with a constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, 
pr uh, programming and that can be also used for uh, solving um, scheduling uh, problems. Schedule. Schedule, you have a task, you have a time slots, and you have resources. And you need to assign a task to given time slots using given resources in a such a way that the task can be accomplished. In the similar way as we had, uh, mm, uh, let's say, in planning and in um, constraint satisfaction problems, you can consider a complete schedule where all tasks of a given problem are covered. That means you know uh, their times, uh, you know uh, uh, their resources, or there can be a partial schedule. Only some of these tasks are basically resolved. The, uh, the remaining still is not uh, properly assigned. Then you have a consistent schedule in which all constraints are satisfied with regard to resources and tasks uh, and time slots. For example, if uh, you know that on, on a single machine you can perform only one task uh, and uh, the other uh, have to wait. Uh, and now you have a different combinations, like for example, consistent, complete schedule, consistent partial schedule, and so on. Uh, in many cases, you have also a, mm, a given optimization criterion, and you need to assign the task to machine in such a way that uh, uh, this criterion is um, minimized or maximized or is somehow optimal. For example, you will see that in many cases in scheduling, we consider, consider so-called minimum uh, make span, uh, labeled as a main C max. And make span is a, mm, which is a completion time of the last task. So we have a network of task, uh, tasks and uh, mm, uh, each of them is somehow completed and you take the maximum completion time and that uh, basically defines uh, the max spans. And you, and you uh, try to create a schedule in such a way that this max span is minimum. So more formally, uh, you try to make an optimal allocation of resources, task over a time. And usually you have a limited amount of resources and you try to achieve uh, a maximization given constraints, given the, um, uh, the criterion. We deal with the uh, machines. Uh, we label them as a MI, that means machine I, when I is uh, from uh, 1 to M, and you deal with the uh, jobs, job JJ, when J can be from 1 to N, and uh, operation is the processing of a given job, uh, for example, J on a machine I. So basically, I, J means job. J on machine I. Of course, a job can be composed from several operations. Uh, in, in, and ex here is the example when job four has three operations with non-zero non processing times, and they should be performed on the machine two, three, and six. So we have a two, four, three, four, six, four operations uh, and uh, for the machines two, three, uh, six, when job four should be performed on these machines. In many cases, you can create so-called Gantt chart when uh, on the 
uh, horizontal axis, you have a time running in some units, like from 0 to 8. You have a machine from M1 to M3. And you have a task from T1 till T9. And uh, uh, each rectangle basically uh, specify the slots, time slots in the uh, on the time interval that it for example T6 is um, performed on machine M3 from 0 to 2 units of times. Now there are several parameters that are considered during uh, scheduling and these parameters uh, of a given job uh, are either static that means they are known um, uh, during the specification of the scheduling task and that is processing time pj or pij if uh, it depends on the machine i so basically it is a how long takes to process job j on machine i then there is a release date of j rj and it is the earliest starting time for of job J. Um, then you have a due time, DJ. And it is a committed completion time for job J. In other words, it is a preference. Uh, our client wishes that job J should be um, uh, finished at time DJ. There is also deadline, uh, which is the time when job J must be finished at latest. It is a hard requirement. For example, uh, in some cases, uh, if you pass the deadline, the client is no more interested uh, uh, in the delivery. Uh, in some cases, uh, some tasks and some jobs are uh, more important than others. So we need to wait uh, them, uh, uh, let's say, in the processing uh, in such a way that, uh, let's say, we achieve the maximum gain and satisfy as many clients as possible and important uh, clients. That, so these are the static parameters. There are basically given before scheduling starts. Then we have a dynamic parameters. Dynamic parameters are basically uh, derived during the scheduling. And these are basically two of them. Start time, SIJ or SJ. And it is a time when job J is started on machine I. And of course, completion time. That means CJ or CIJ. Time when job J is uh, finished, um, its processing is finished um, on machine I. So these are the, the two parameters for job J that needs to be derived during scheduling. These are the parameters that are given before the task starts, uh, scheduling task, uh, scheduling starts. OK, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, uh, scheduling solutions, problems are rather very uh, different. And there is a huge pile of methods and so on. So my question is, uh, Pinedo, who is the uh, one of the very good guy uh, writing about scheduling uh, problems, he, uh, his book has uh, 694 pages. Uh, there are parts of the book, there are uh, chapters, and there are subchapters. And each subchapter is focused on a given aspect of scheduling. And my question is to you, uh, how many subchapters has the book? What is your estimate? And again, we have four questions. So the possible answers are 20, 53, 
subchapters, 74 subchapters, 180 subchapters. So what do you think? How many sub chapters has the book? So oh, we are almost there. Okay, it seems everybody who wanted to vote already won. Uh, voted so the answer is this one the book has 20 chapters however 108 sub chapters so this is uh, just to somehow to stress that the number of possible different kind of uh, scheduling problems is really large. And we will t uh, mention today only a few, very few of them. Thank you. Uh, so, and because of this, uh, so-called Graham's classification was introduced. Uh, and it, there are three fields, alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, using these three field notation, we can describe many scheduling problems. Not all of them, but many of them. The first field uh, is dedicated to a machine environment. So basically, it tries to describe uh, what kind of machine environment we have and how job can be assigned to those machines. Beta, the, uh, the center field, uh, it describes constraints applied to jobs. In, in some way, basically, uh, it describes the characteristic uh, uh, characteristics of jobs. Gamma, the last field, describes the objective criterion that is minimized or maximized. And based on the different combinations of these, uh, let's say, specifications, we have a really a huge complexity. We cover a huge complexity for, uh, of um, scheduling problems. Let me make an example. For example, if you see P3 dash uh, uh, line uh, precedent line CMAX, uh, this can be used, for example, for bike assembly. And basically, it means we have uh, three machines, in fact, three people. Uh, each task of the assembly must be uh, accomplished earlier than other. We have a kind of, let's say, order of tasks, how they can be accomplished. And we try to minimize uh, the max span. If we write PM, RJ, sum of WJ, CJ, uh, basically it is an environment of parallel machines when uh, we um, we optimize uh, completion times somehow weighted. So let me first uh, mention the machine environment described uh, using alpha field. If, if there is just one, that means alpha is equal to one, then we have a single machine. If we have identical parallel machines, we label that as a PM. So we have a M identical machines working in pedal with the same uh, speed. And each job consists of a single operation and it lasts 
uh, each uh, job lasts for uh, pj time units. In some cases, we have not we have no identical parallel machines, but for example, uniform parallel machines labeled as a QM. Uh, now, it depends on the speed of this machine. So, processing time of a job J on machine I is given using this formula as a PJ divided by the speed uh, VI. And we have basically a kind of uh, real uh, PIJ uh, time, processing time for um, job process, uh, for uh, job J process on machine I. Uh, and for example, if you deal with a, um, some kind of cloud of computers, uh, you might have a different computers with processing having different speeds. Then, if we can deal with the parallel machines which are unrelated, labeled as a RM. And here, each machine has a different speed for different jobs. So, if we deal with the machine I and job J, uh, we consider the sp speed VIJ it depends on both job and machine. And, uh, and again, the processing time is computed as a PJ divided by VIJ. Uh, example, uh, for example, you have a vector computer that computes vector-oriented tasks faster than the classical PC. So if the task is, can be, um, uh, can be uh, computed uh, using vector-based hardware, then uh, basically, the speed is for, uh, higher and so on. Now, uh, there are several other uh, um, possibilities that are called shop problems. In shop problems, each task is executed sequentially on several machines. So, each job can be described as a several operations, IJ, job J on machine I. And um, that operation uh, takes PIJ time to process job J on the machine I. For example, if job J has four operations, 1J, 2J, 3J, 4J, for example, like this, processing. It is, uh, it is processed at first on machine R, uh, 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. Uh, these shop problems are classical problems that are studied mainly in so-called operation research. So if uh, you uh, in the future, you will have a problem in, uh, as a shop problem. Uh, search for operation research uh, books and uh, um, let's say papers, and they will describe. They will hint you how how to process, uh, how to deal with that. Real problems are of course much more complicated because uh, you need to uh, utilize the knowledge uh, of a given domain on the specific task and so on. Then we have so-called flow shop, labeled as a FM. You have a M machines in a series. And each job must be processed on each machine. Uh, so basically, and, and there are all of them that are following the same route. So the first machine one, then machine two, and so on. Uh, In many cases, we uh, call them as a permutation flow shop uh, when those um, jobs are processed in the same order on all machines. Then, uh, 
then we can deal with a flexible flow shop labeled as a FFS. It is a generalization of the uh, flow shop here. Uh, you have a S phases and each phase contains a set of parallel machines. So you have a one phase uh, like this and each having uh, several machines uh, and like for example if we have a phase one, phase two, phase three having two, one and three machines. It is basically a flow shop with a S parallel machines and each job uh, must be processed in all phases however it is performed on any machine uh, assigned to a given phase so this is a flexible flow shop then we have a job shop labeled as a JM Again, it is a flow shop with M machines. However, in this case, each job has its own predetermined route to follow. Although some mm, processing time for a given job on the specific machines is might be zero. That route is specified using this kind of notation. That means Job J on machine I is followed by processing job J on machine K. So in other words, uh, processing of uh, job J must be done earlier on machine I, then followed by the machine on machine K. And the full route can be uh, described using this notation. 2J followed by 1J followed by 3J followed by 4J. There are also uh, environments when we speak about so called open shop, denoted as OM. It is again flow shop with M machines, and again processing time might be zero on some machines. However, in this case, we have no routing restriction as here. Okay? In the job shop, we had a this route while here we are basically we miss that root restriction at the uh, beginning and it is a part of the scheduling uh, solution to divide to define the routing uh, restrictions so in a kind of summary overview uh, for shop models we have M machines, N jobs. Uh, we have M, J as a set machines of machines where job J uh, has to be processed. Then for each, uh, we have uh, operations. Uh, we have uh, operations I, J, uh, where job J uh, and I are belonging to that to those machines um, and J which are a subset of all machines and processing time is PIJ J on a machine I and then we have a precedence uh, um, specifying the precedent constraints on the uh, on the operations then flow shop in flow shop we deal with all machines that means the all jobs share the same set of machines and we have a precedence uh, using uh, these uh, let's say mapping that ij is followed by i plus one j if we deal with a job shop then the precedence uh, uh, relation contains a chain uh, starting from I one J and ending with an I and none so let's say uh, a number of machines dedicated to processing of job J and in open shop we deal with a 
let's say uniformly assigned machines. However, we don't know at the beginning the precedent relation. Okay, that was about machine environment. Job characteristic describe the field beta. Uh, those uh, characteristics can be described as a precedent constraints. Uh, usually, it describes some kind of linear sequence or tree structure. And um, uh, it is, in many cases, abbreviated as a, um, A is followed by B, uh, meaning that uh, completion time of uh, job A, in other words, starting time plus processing time, is a completion time of uh, job A is less than or equal to starting time of um, job B. And it, as an example, you can consider that bike assembly. In some cases, you need to allow uh, um, that a job with a higher priority can interrupt the current job, a job and uh, we deal with the so-called preemptions, PMTN abbreviation. Then, uh, let's say not all machines are uniform. Some of them are more suitable to, uh, to be used for job J. So, for example, if you deal with the time uh, scheduling, uh, then you need to assign appropriate room um, to accommodate uh, a given number of students in the classroom. So, or for example, uh, you need to use a specific computer with an appropriate hardware graphic library and so on. Then, in some cases, you have a, you don't deal only with the uh, machines, but you need also to deal with the workers, workforces, because some machines can be operated by uh, um, basically specialists. Uh, um, operators who have uh, basically skills to operate such a machine and uh, you might have a different uh, groups uh, of those people and so on and then you need to consider those limitations as well. Then you might have a routing constraints that means uh, how uh, machine jobs can be executed uh, and they are usually specified by the order of job executions, like in the shop problems. Uh, and as, as I stressed, uh, job shop problem, the operation order is given in advance, while in open shop problem, the route is basically derived during the scheduling. Then uh, you can have uh, additional constraints on, on the execution. For example, if you perform job K after the job J on machine I, it can uh, it uh, it can be a different time. Uh, it there might be some uh, let's say uh, you, you cannot use the full speed. Uh, it costs somehow um, uh, to perform such a, a um, operation. For example. Uh, you have a, a factory with a, uh, a, a, let's say, producing a lemonade, and uh, then uh, you have a pipes filling those, uh, uh, let's say, bottles. And uh, when you uh, change the type of lemonade, you need to clean the pipes, uh, you switch it, uh, and it takes time, um, uh, and so on. And so uh, all the same is, for example, for traveling salesman problem that can be specified using this way. OK, optimization. I mentioned earlier so-called makesman, which is the maximum, and Cmax is a maximum completion time. So each job uh, is completed in a given time, C1 to Cn, and you take 
the maximum of these times and that's so-called make span uh, labeled as a C max. Example, you have a two resources, timeline, job, uh, jobs assigned in this way uh, and you can see that uh, one is finished at one, two at three, three at four, these numbers, uh, four at five, five at eight, six at seven, and seven at nine. The maximum is nine, so the C max is nine. If we minimize max span, then we also maximize uh, the throughput through the machines. And also, it can be shown that we uh, produce uh, a schedule that uniformly load uh, machines. That's important, for example, for load balancing. If you have, a, uh, again, a kind of cluster of uh, computers, you need to perform uh, processing in such a way that uh, the machines are, um, let's say, properly uh, utilized uh, because it costs energy and basically about the data center are nothing else than how to deal with the dissipation of uh, energy in such environment and uh, uh, so it, you need to switch those machines in such a way that um, they can be cooled properly and you don't need to uh, let's say to use uh, the, the uh, entire stream of the nearby river for cooling that. Uh, if you rearrange these tasks on those resources, uh, you can see that, uh, let's say, completion time can be slightly different and the maximum is seven. So by rearrangement, uh, you achieve, uh, let's say, shorter make span and also resources are utilized. Um, let's say more uniformly and basically it is a basic criterion that it is used very often. Then we can uh, define so-called lateness. Lateness is defined as a Lx, L, uh, L max and it's a difference between the actual completion time and it's due time when we prefer to be, uh, let's say, to be finished. So the difference is a kind of delay or, or um, and so on. And we can uh, maximize, uh, we can find the maxim, maximum lateness as a maximum of this uh, uh, lateness for uh, all jobs. L max is a maximum L1 from L1 to Ln. And the criterion is minimization of this maximum lightness. So we try to minimize the difference between the actual completion time and the preference of the clients. Again, an example. Uh, what the let's say job one a should be completed at uh, eight two at six at uh, fourteen and job three at ten however job one is completed actually at four uh two at sixteen and three at ten so we have a lateness like 4 minus 8, 16 minus 14, 10 minus 10. As I said, C is C1 is 4, D1 is 8. Okay, 4 minus 8. Uh, so basically we have a lateness minus 4, 2 and uh, 0. The maximum is 2. So um, uh, the maximum... Uh, mm, 
uh, lateness is two, and we try to minimize that number. If we do maximum of the lateness and zero, we call that number as a job tardiness, labeled as denoted as a TJ. In this case, all tardiness are positive numbers. So it makes sense to um, to uh, uh, define so-called total tardiness as a sum of tardiness of each job, and again to try to minimize the total tardiness. In other words, you try to minimize uh, these differences. Basically, um, formula is almost the same, only here we have the maximization with a zero. Uh, so uh, we have here uh, 4 minus 8 is minus 4. However, maximum is 0. So the tardiness uh, for jobs are 0, 2, and 0. And its sum is 2. Uh, in num some cases, uh, we also can introduce the weights uh, based on the jobs. And we try to minimize uh, this total weighted tardiness. Okay, that was the case again the same and uh, so just let me stress the difference lateness is a difference between uh, actual completion time and its due time and it can be uh, negative if completion time is uh, uh, smaller than due time tardiness has that constraint to be always positive, and it is now somehow cut it here. In many cases, we deal with this kind of uh, cost when basically we pay nothing before due time, we pay something uh, after that. In practice, uh, uh, we pay even something before because you need to store the result somewhere, for example, like uh, uh, you need to use kind of storage and maintenance. Uh, references and so on then in a due time it does not cost anything when you are later then the cost uh, uh, basically going up and usually it is somehow limited by the agreement or something like that okay that was a classification of scheduling problem some uh, uh, let's say basic uh, uh, field values uh, dealing with a machine environment, job characteristics, and their optimizations. Now, how to solve them? How it, let's say, how uh, general methods of the solution look like? They can be either constructive, in other words, you start from the empty schedule and step by step you add additional job to the schedule in such a way that the schedule remains consistent. Okay, that's usually how we do that as a humans also. Then you can use local search. You start with a complete, however, non-consistent schedule, like for example, generated in the random way. And then you try to modify it to, to find a similar schedule however that is a better that means in such in such a way that for example the quality is uh, higher or uh, like my expand is for example lower um, or uh, for example some criteria can be based on the evaluation of the schedule consistency in other words for example you can uh, you can count how many constraints of the precedents are violated. And of course, the practical um, better method uses these hybrid approaches combining both of them that they are, let's say, partially constructive, partially searched. Local search algorithm. Well, it's quite 
simple. At first, you initialize it. That means you create uh, an initial schedule S0. And uh, so far, you record the best uh, scheduling problem. That means you basically evaluate the cost of this S0 schedule. Then you select a schedule, another one, that is in the neighborhood of that uh, uh, previous schedule. Basically, you try to modify SK uh, schedule to get uh, another schedule. Uh, if you are not able to find it, well, then, uh, mm, or in a such a way that the schedule acceptance criterion is not uh, satisfied, then the algorithm finishes with a failure. Uh, if uh, the cost of the new uh, of the new uh, schedule is better than currently known best cost, then you remember it. And you repeat it, uh, uh, let's say, many times. Finally, uh, if uh, all, uh, let's say, um, criteria are fulfilled or a kind of stop criterions uh, are or constraints are satisfied, then you finish this. So basically, you, um, you, you find the schedule that it is, uh, let's say, appropriate enough or optimal enough so you can accept it. Of course, all these, the, 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 this method uh, suffer from that you can find on a local optimum while uh, you would be pleased if you can reach uh, the global optimum. That's the traditional problem of the AI techniques. Uh, for example, Let's make an example, a more restrictive uh, method. Uh, if we have a schedule that uh, makes just the permutation of n jobs, for example, you have a, uh, six jobs, I have a sequence of those jobs, uh, and uh, you try to generate uh, the following schedule. So. If you have a, such a sequence, you can change um, uh, just two neighboring jobs. And because you have a n jobs here, you have a n minus pairs, or let's say, uh, in the sequence. So you have a n minus one possible schedules in the neighborhood, the branching factor, basically. Uh, n minus 1. In this case, we have, uh, let's say, example here, we just um, switched, swapped these uh, two uh, jobs here. Or another strategy that is used for generation of the neighborhood uh, is uh, the following one. You select an arbitrary job from the schedule and place it somewhere else in arbitrary position. So we have a n jobs originally from which you can select and n minus one possible um, uh, places when you can place it. So it is n by multiplied by n minus one possible schedules in the neighborhood. And as you can see, the number of schedules grows in very rapid way. For example, here you take four job four and you place it here okay so basically from this original schedule you get another one that has uh, the sequence somehow modified uh, you can have a, a criteria that uh, allows you to uh, accept or refuse a given schedule and in fact uh, the majority of methods differ mainly because of these different criteria uh, and, uh, and basically you need to answer the questions like where is good to accept a better schedule 
uh, it is in all time or only just sometimes can you accept also even the worst schedule sometimes and everything deals with that how to avoid with the issue how to avoid those local minima methods how to tackle that is basically to use uh, for example uh, techniques like probabilistic techniques using random walk that means with a very small probability like 0 0.01 a worst schedule is accepted so we have a, a kind of uh, escape probability from the local minima or uh, techniques like simulated annealing and so on deterministic uh, methods they are usually based on taboo search uh, taboo uh, search method uses so-called taboo list and uh, taboo list uh, uh, basically contains modifications of the let's say last uh, steps uh, that cannot be performed again in fact it is how to avoid cycling in the uh, scheduling problem so and we will basically follow just uh, this method table search we maintain table list in such a way that the last steps of the algorithm perform some modifications of the to the schedules and we remember those several last modifications and those modifications of the schedule which are in the table list they cannot be used uh, for uh, the in the current uh, modification so a table list is a list of forbidden modifications in this way we uh, basically uh, protect the method against uh, cycling because uh, for example we could exchange job three and four in the next step uh, again uh, to exchange back in the back uh, let's say with a four and three and uh, you can create a loop and uh, the, basically the method is not able to escape it uh, the table list uh, is not usually long it is uh, it has usually fixed length uh, like often the number is like five or till nine uh, if it is longer, uh, let's say the oldest modifications are removed from that list. Now, uh, how the length of the list list should be, let's say, uh, determined uh, is not easy because if it's too small, then uh, cycling risk increases. If it is too high, that we forbid a number of uh, possible modification and we uh, can uh, miss appropriate uh, let's say branch to search through so uh, if it is too uh, if the high if the length is too high then the search is too uh, constrained also there are techniques like uh, to use a kind of aspiration criterion that allows uh, to make changes directly in the table list uh and uh, let's say and to improve uh, let's say it's uh, efficient so the algorithm is again very similar to the classical searching methods that means uh we said the, the step uh, to be one we select initial schedule using for example heuristics and we call it as a best so far then we select the neighboring schedule um, if the modification from sk to sc is forbidden because of the table list then we repeat the selection of another uh, um, schedule from the neighborhood if if it if it is it not forbidden then uh, we assign uh, the schedule sk plus one in the next step to be sc the, just the selected uh, and we uh, um, save the reverse change 
in the table list. Uh, if it is long, uh, longer than, uh, let's say, the prescribed, we remove the last item. And of course, if the cost of the new schedule is better than currently known best schedule, then we update uh, its reference. And this is repeated uh, again many times. If stopping condition is satisfied, then finished. Uh, and otherwise continue. Let me make an example, and this is the example that can you can tackle during the examination. So uh, we have a scheduling problem defined as a with a one machine, due times, and weighted tardiness. Just to remind you, tardiness is a, a maximum from lateness computed as a difference between the actual completion time and its due time and zero and the table says that we have four jobs processing times like this due time like this and weights like this another part of the specification says well all schedules can be obtained in the neighborhood by pair exchange. So basically, uh, that pairwise based uh, exchange of neighboring jobs. The selection, select always the best schedule. Tabulist, we use last two modifications. And uh, we start from the initial schedule like this, 2, 1, 4, 3, and perform four iterations, the full determination of the, of the uh, scheduling task. So we repeat here the table. Here is the initial schedule. And we calculate for this initial schedule its cost as a weighted sum of tardiness. So the first is 2. 2 ends up at uh, it weighted weights is 12 the completion time is 10 and due time is 2 so basically 10 minus 2 is 8 so here it is like this uh, from these two we get uh, 8 plus then there is a 1 Completion time is for 2, it was 10, for 1, it is 10 plus 10, it is 20, okay? So, uh, wait, it 14, and... 20 completion time minus due time for 20 minus 4 is 16. So this and this, okay? For 4, okay? 4 has weight 12. Completion time for 4 is 20 plus 4, which is 24. And 24 and due time is 12. So 24 minus 12 is these 12s and so on. And I will not perform the last one. Uh, you can do that. So if you calculate this, you get a 500. That is the cost of the best, uh, uh, best um, schedule so far. If you do that for, let's say, you exchange two one, you'd get one, two, four, three. If you get this one, four, that means it is a two, four, one, three. And if you exchange four, three, you will get two, one, three, four. In the same way, you'll calculate the, let's say the uh, weighted tardiness. You will get the numbers like 480, 436, and 652. Uh, 
and uh, the best is 436 and so basically you remember the change uh, 41 that means in the opposite direction 14 okay you exchange this to jobs and you will place it to the double list and you do do same thing for uh, uh, let's say now you have a this two four one three as the best uh, in the next step with a cost 436 and you perform again pairwise exchanges so basically uh, these three um, these three uh, new schedules in the neighborhood you calculate their cost now here we would prefer uh, let's say perform the table list operation modification so basically uh, this is not allowed and we select best from these two which is uh, this uh, one as the best and we remember this ex exchange that means two four okay and it shifts uh, uh, in this direction repeat the same thing uh, uh, several times times exactly here we are just repeat the table and iteration and iteration and it is the four iteration that means uh, we reached here so far the best uh, um, uh, schedule with a cost of 408 any Can question to this <laughs> yeah. yes uh, so in this uh, taboo algorithm we go uh, the specified number of iterations or we stop uh, if we are in local minima uh, of course you can go uh, based on the local minima but uh, let's say for demonstration example you can also specify uh, and uh, that you perform only four iterations okay and this is let's say to simplify the task for uh, educational purposes yeah. uh, in real in reality you would go to the local minima okay and in this example uh, isn't uh, local minima the second iteration we have this one this uh, th the last black uh, you think let, let's say uh this number or which number uh this one the, yes 436 okay yeah this is basically uh, uh, uh you don't consider this let's say starting you uh starting point uh mm, of course it, it is locally for how many maps uh Yes, it 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 was it was uh, basically the first uh, the, um, the 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 second schedule was the local uh, minima and based on that you can continue further you are able to achieve even, let's say uh, to get even the better four hundred and eight okay yes and it, it is not guaranteed that if you perform additional steps you would get even better. This is, uh, let's say, uh, this is because the taboo search uh, basically allows you to escape this local, uh, this local minimum. Okay, and I look in the chat, and Petr Poshik wrote that uh, the taboo list helps to overcome the local minima. Yeah, exactly. Thank okay. you. It is basically, 
it is basically the uh, how to avoid looping because cycling in a specific place uh, because if you would uh, don't do that you would try to escape uh, local minima I would return back back to the local minima and in this table basically it, you, are, you enforce the algorithm to go out now of course uh, the table search basically the table list maintains a kind of uh, let's say uh, the the length of the path to the nearest uh, extreme that can be uh, overcome but that is let's say more generally statistically not exactly uh, how it works okay any question other not I will continue it's quite strange that okay um, okay flow shop scheduling I will uh, mention the solution for the uh, uh, for the uh, very simple task so-called F2 uh, CMAX uh, which is the flow shop environment with the two machines and jobs the objective function is a CMAX uh, bank span and uh, an arrival times of jobs um, release time is all, for all of them are zero this uh, the, the solution to this task can be described uh, by a sequence P and the problem was uh, let's say theoretically solved by Johnson in 1954 uh, uh, so you will see the example again and however uh, let's say at first the I will describe the algorithm first what you do you split the jobs to the two uh, sets in the set U you will place all jobs where uh, the processing time on the first machine is lower than on the second machine okay and the rest of jobs will be placed to the uh, set V in which in that case you will have uh, jobs which processing time on the first machine is higher than uh, on the second machine then you take these jobs in the U set and you order them in non decreasing order by their processing times on the first machine non decreasing order by their processing times on the first machine you order them uh, in non decreasing order based on this on these numbers and in V uh, you will do the same thing but as a non increasing order on, on the processing P uh, 2J and then basically you concatenate these two sequences which is the schedule quite simple let me uh, uh, demonstrate it on the example you have a first machine uh, and uh, basically uh, you have a uh, let's say fixed sequence that is first jobs uh, that is that are uh, processed on the first machine and then on the second machine example you have a jobs from one to eight processing times from in, in the first uh, for the first machine on the in the first line this uh, processing times for the second machine on the uh, second line so you set is you place there jobs which has lower uh, processing time on the first machine that means a two then three and then six and the rest has higher uh, 
processing time in the first machine and they will be placed on the V uh, set. Now you will make the order of these two, three, six in the U based uh, as, as a non decreasing order. So basically it should go up based on the processing uh, time on the first machine. That means two, one, three. Uh, and the same similarly for the uh, second uh, set V, but in this case, oops, non increasing order on the second machine. Okay. So here the order is this one based on these numbers. So order of task based on these numbers, order these tasks based on the second uh, processing times. And then basically you can just calculate the completion times. So just you are starting from zero, completion time of three is one. Uh, on the second machine, it is a, a one plus two, the three, then two is, uh, it complete uh, the first previous task in one plus two, uh, basically is three. And uh, uh, well, then uh, three plus six on the second task is a nine. Again, uh, six means you have a completion time of the previous three plus three is six and six plus seven, oops, sorry. Should. Okay, this is not correct. Uh, um, of course, it is a nine previous task plus seven is 16, like that. Okay? And you continue in the same uh, way through the uh, whole uh, chain of uh, jobs, and you will end up that the C max is 37, the last one. So, is it okay? So you know how to uh, uh, schedule problem that is called F2 CMAX. You have two machines, several jobs in the sequence, uh, uh, and try to, uh, let's say, to order them in such a way that this last number is the lowest one. Job shop scheduling. It is just, uh, let's say, to mention here that if you have a, uh, let's say that um, you have a completion times of operation IJ, you have a uh, uh, precedence uh, relation that should be respected. In other words, starting time, uh, uh, starting time of uh, If you have a on machine K and on machine I, so the uh, starting time uh, of on machine I uh, of job J must be higher than the completion time of the previous task. No two operations of the same job uh, are processed at the same time. Um, so basically, uh, you have either uh, for the job J, you must have a, that the starting time on machine I is higher than the completion time on the K or in opposite way. No two operations are processed jointly on the same machine. In other words, uh, basically, uh, you have a two jobs J and L, and regarding within the same machine I, and the starting time of job J uh, cannot be um, must be higher or uh, than the uh, let's say the start uh, completion time of the task l or in the opposite way uh, 
if we say this or 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 and so on then there are called so-called disjunctive constraints uh, and based on these uh, let's say relations uh, binary relations we can construct a graph so uh, basically we have the order precedence relations we have disjunctive uh, conditions uh, constraints and the planning then is performed on this kind of graphs and you search um, using uh, several techniques uh, the appropriate uh, configuration of possible the path through the schedule I will not go here in the details just to remember that these top uh, uh, shop scheduling uh, can be solved using based on these constraints using disjunctive graph and the last method I will uh, let's say describes in the last 15 minutes is a called critical path method uh, that method uh, uses parallel machines jobs are subjective to precedence constraints and again the objective is to minimize the max span it can be shown that this task when number of machines is higher than jobs then we deal with a critical path method if it is lower than the number of jobs then the mm, uh, the task is np hard the critical path method was introduced in let's say uh, 60s in 1960s uh, years when Americans uh, developed uh, um, some kind of uh, military machines it was a rocket spared and uh, they used it as the first uh, use this method at the first time and um, um, this method uh, is used quite heavily in the practice you have a, um, a even software you can purchase like uh, Microsoft project or Hart, uh, Harvard project uh, and when you can specify the jobs and uh, uh, number of these uh, let's say issues and it will be automatically calculated uh, for you uh, so and how it will be calculated uh, first we need to define what is a slack job slack job uh, has a, a processing time starting let's say the start of its processing time can be postponed in other words uh, it is a job if you start it later in the specific range of time you don't uh, increase make span those jobs which cannot be postponed and then must be immediately started uh, they are called critical jobs and the set of the critical jobs create so-called critical path it is a basically a set a sequence of jobs that as a manager you need to check every time because any delay on this path means that uh, your make span is longer uh, uh, it was one of the method that I when I was in the practice in the let's say research institute institute Oracle automation and I tackled uh, uh, with my team several let's say projects uh, and if they lasted for for example like six nine months uh, I had about uh, let's say from 10 to 15 people I used this method quite heavily because otherwise it wouldn't be possible to maintain appropriate uh, let's say uh, time completion so, uh, the solution is quite not trivial but quite easy uh, you perform two uh, mm, two sweeps uh, in the forward procedure you will get the schedule with the make span and in the uh, backward procedure you will basically um, uh, calculate uh, um, those slacks and so on so basically we have a PJ processing type of J, uh, J S dash CJ dash our earliest 
possible starting time and completion time for job J. Of course, completion time uh, is given by the starting time and, and the processing time. And this uh, 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 notation means that we deal with all jobs that are predecessors of job J. So first, you will start with a job of those a job J that has no uh, uh, predecessors. In other words, uh, you can um, set the starting time as uh, zero and completion time as a as a PJ. Then, based on completed uh, completed uh, jobs K that uh, that. Uh, 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 are predecessors of J, J uh, that they are going to solve. You basically uh, take the maximum completion time of those predecessors. So they have to be accomplished, uh, completed before job J is started. And then you have a earliest possible starting time for job J. Um, and of course, if you have that, you have also completion time. If you are, if you finish with these assignments, uh, the maximum completion time is a max span. Then, in the backward procedure, you determine the latest possible starting time and completion time. So, in the previous, uh, it was earliest. While in the backward procedure, it is the latest possible start. And they are uh, denoted as a double primed uh, possible starting time and completion time. And again, this notation means jobs that successors that are successors of job J. So, and you go from the opposite direction. So you start with the jobs that has no successors, just from the end, and then uh, in which, to which you can assign the completion time C max, and of course the latest possible starting time is computed using this C max minus uh, P J its processing time. And again, for those which are for which you know all. Uh, uh, following starting uh, times, latest starting times, you can derive uh, the latest completion time, uh, latest possible uh, completion time, and based on that you can uh, uh, calculate uh, latest possible starting time of job J. And you basically going in the backward way, uh, and again, finishing with the first, uh, and it should be zero. Now, those uh, jobs that earliest possible starting times differ from the latest possible starting times are select jobs. In other words, these jobs can be postponed uh, between the earliest and latest starting times. Those which are have those times equal, we call critical jobs. And uh, from those critical jobs, we have a we can create a chain of jobs as a that is called a critical path. And it is ex uh, let's say basically the path uh, sequence of jobs that uh, on, uh, uh, at which you cannot postpone them. Let me make an example. You have jobs from 1 to 9, processing time like these, and their precedence uh, dependency is like this. So basically, job 1 uh, lasting for 4 units is followed by job 2 lasting uh, for 9 units. So basically, the, this is the specification of the task, and you try to solve it uh, with this table. Uh, you, 
you start the forward procedure that means you know that these one and three are not uh, preceded by any other uh, jobs so basically we can assign uh, one to uh, say zero starting time for to one and three uh, and uh, we can calculate the completion time zero plus four is four zero plus three is three then two can be calculated the starting time is this one that means uh, it is again four plus nine uh, means uh, completion time uh, is 13 earliest one for four it means it starts at completion time of the three so uh, it is this three three plus three uh, is six then basically we have uh, the five uh, job five uh, can we derive so it uh, it starts after the four uh, that means uh, at, that was completed at six so this is the six and six by uh, plus six is 12 so this is this relation now six job now we have also this completed also so uh, it uh, it is uh, six is the maximum of these two completion time the first and um, two is 13 uh, here uh, for uh, uh, the five is 12 so maximum of 13 and 12 is 13 and uh, plus uh, eight means 21 so this 13 was this one and this 12 is this one okay well and you continue in this uh, way until all tasks are not uh, let's say the first two lines are fulfilled and you will end up with the maximum completion time which is this one 32 for job 7 so this is uh, then in the next step uh, in the backward procedure uh, assigned as a as a completion time of the task nine and seven and for ta na uh, task job nine we have a 32 minus six that is tw uh, uh, let's say latest possible starting time is 26 for seven it is 32 minus 8 that means 24 and again uh, if because you have these two already resolved you can uh, calculate this one and the 8 so we have a, a minimum uh, uh, from 24 and 26 which is 24 this is the uh, latest uh, no, mm, possible completion time 24 if you do, uh, subtract processing time you get uh, 24 minus 12 12 uh, as a as a start, uh, latest possible start and again you continue in this direction uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, to fulfill this table and here is that you get already the zero to, to verify so this is the how to calculate this table based on that uh, for example completion times 3 and 3 6 and 6 12 and 12 32 and 32 24 and 24 these are basically the um, the same is valid for starting times 0, 0, 3, 3, 6, 6, 24, 24, 12, 12. So basically, these tasks which are labeled here as red uh, are the critical, uh, critical task. Uh, you label them. This is basically uh, the critical path. You have earliest and latest possible 
starting and completion time equal. So basically any delay in these tasks means that the make span is will be higher and the rest of uh, jobs are basically slack jobs and as you can see uh, for example for job one it can be started at zero then it will finish at four however it, it can be also started at three uh, and uh, it will end up at seven of course if this is delay then uh, this task might become to be critical that's it uh, critical path method can be extended and it is as it is performed in the practice with a uh, stoch stochastic uh, estimation for durations you can also calculate with non availability of resources or you can have a multiple resources uh, types uh, you can uh, the activities might be interrupted you can do that for individual projects and you can combine these projects into the multiple projects uh, uh, and they will basically uh, be planned in in let's say uh, shared more and uh, the objectives uh, can be that you you minimize the all projects durations you can ask that the resource will be leveled in other words that the loading peaks will not be um, uh, some exceeded uh, that you don't use only one specific resource and the rest uh, will are loaded in let's say the minimum way so in, for example uh, in software development it would mean that everything will would be done by one developer and occasionally the others would be used which is not acceptable uh, and you can optimize the resource utilization factors and so on that's it. Everything. We have minus two minutes. Okay. Still, do you have any question? Uh, during the examination, all these three tasks, which I showed you the example, might be used for your examination. So, if anything is not clear, ask immediately. And as I told you, uh, this critical path method, when I was a manager or leader of software development team, even we were as a research team, um, I use it heavily on daily basis in the, let's say, industrial environment. OK, it seems that everything is clear. So uh, I hope that you understood how this table was derived. It is not uh, uh, quite involved, so but you can make a number of mistakes. So I will end the.